Hey everyone, welcome to Flightcast. You know, Mark, I do the intro for every episode. I think uh, I think you should give this one a go. Really? Yeah. Go get it. All right. Well, go ahead and turn that spotlight over to me. All right, you're on. All right, appreciate it. <laughs> All right, well, here it goes. Hey, y'all. Welcome to Flightcast, the one and the only Infinite Flight podcast. Infinite Flight, if you don't know, is a mobile flight simulator that you can use on your phone or your tablet with live air traffic as well as live air traffic control. I'm Mark Denton, and most of you guys know me as Skyhawk Kevy. And with me today is our host, Jason Rosewell, straight out of Canada. Hey, buddy, what's going on? Mark, that was beautiful. I know. Nice I, it's a gift. <laughs> hey, man, I appreciate you taking the reins on that one. Uh, what's Not new in the FDS world these days? Um, and, and actually, you know what? Let's just back the train up a little bit here. Um, sometimes I think we don't give quite enough context. Um, we know that this is a podcast about Infinite Flight. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, FDS is Flying Development Studio, and that's the company that actually creates Infinite Flight. So FDS. That's who I work for. That's proudly. who Mark and Mark is now an employee as of uh, how long now? Mm, going on nine months. Ooh, excellent. So Mark's been an employee there for almost a year, and the the rumors of a new airplane release have become fact. We have the C one hundred and thirty coming. Yes. Uh, talk to me about that, Mark. Very excited, man. Look, that was my main mission when I got hired with infinite flight. Well, my first mission was to get a Northwest bowling shoe livery on an Airbus on one of the three twenty family. I got it on the three nineteen. Next mission, C one thirty. And <clears throat> of course the cat's out of the bag now. Um and you know we're we're still working on it. We got a little ways to go. Uh so I know everybody's excited about it. And guys, I cannot wait for for everyone to to get a hold of this thing she's a beauty the c-130 is by far my favorite aircraft i mean i grew up around c-130s with my father in the coast guard for 26 years and flew on the c-130 so that was my main mission was to get a c-130 and it's it, the, it it's so multi-mission capable and you know it's just going to add so much to the flight sim. I, I'm completely stoked about it, man. I'm so excited. Yeah, it's and it's already, they haven't f- finished tuning it yet, but it's already super fun to fly. Uh, yeah, and that thing, very much. Just like in, in real life, that thing stops on a dime. So it's really, really fun to do the uh, assault landings and stuff like that. Mark, did you get to like, it is. did you get to fly with your dad uh, at all in the C-130? No, um, I never got to do that. The only time I ever got to fly was in a helicopter, of all things, an H3 uh, Pelican, which the Coast Guard no longer has. Um, got to fly on one of those one time, but uh, I always wanted to fly in the C-130 and never got a chance to. Now, I've loaded probably 10 of them. Oh, uh, when okay. I worked out at Northwest, I also worked for a company that is a contractor for rampers. Uh, you know, basically for ground support and, you know, they did a lot of the main lines and all that Northwest. We had our own crew. And of course I worked up in Memphis and everything else, but, um, but I worked with this, uh, this contractor for, uh, ground support and I did a lot of the, uh, you know, the military that would come in, uh, a lot of times, uh, right after, uh, one of the, uh, what was it? I want to say, uh, the Persian Gulf, uh, the, the Gulf war that we had over there back in the early nineties. Okay. Um, uh, when they were flying troops home, you know, they were bringing them in on KC one thirty fives and we would get some C one thirties in with cargo and stuff like that. And so I've had the ability and because I've worked, I was able to, uh, work a forklift, uh, as well as a K loader, I was always tasked to go work on those flights. And so, you know, I've, I've, I've loaded, several C-130s, which is what my father did. He was a load master and drop master. And so I can actually say, and it's an, it's an awesome feeling to say, I've been able to do what my father did. I just didn't get to do it in the Coast Guard. Mm, gotcha. Very cool, man. 
Well, I'm I'm yeah. excited to see it uh, arrive, and uh, we can talk to our guests a little bit today, hopefully, about um, what goes into creating some of those libraries. So uh, I want to, again, Mark, highlight, uh, for those of you who are not following us on YouTube yet, if you go to youtube.com slash flightcast audio, we've got most of these episodes on YouTube. So if you prefer YouTube over iTunes or Google Play or just going on the website, Make sure you subscribe, give us a thumbs up on the channel, youtube.com slash flightcast audio, and there is uh, the second second or third to last video that we posted is um, I got to fly in the a kit airplane called the Murphy Rebel with my friend Cam, and uh, there's a, a video there called Flying the Murphy Rebel and Avoiding Disaster, and it's just a cool little feature film that I did. Got to Great shoot some, yeah. Thanks. I shoot, shot some uh, B-roll video at the airport, and I was uh, well fortunate slash I don't know what the right word is. It was interesting anyway uh, to uh, film this almost near miss, um, or I guess it. I guess you could technically call it a near miss. It was a it was a interesting situation anyway. So yeah, that that. That was really, really odd, and you know, it, it, it's great that your friend had some quick reflexes, thought, you know, thought very fast, and stopped the aircraft. Uh, the Hilo, I don't know what she was doing. <laughs> um, no. Why she would need to basically fly the approach? She sees them on the runway, obviously, uh, uh, lining up. Yeah, yeah, and basically not lands, but comes to a hover just in front of him on the runway and then flies As he's starting up the his ramp. role. Yeah. 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 So, and so I'm like, why not just fly directly to the ramp? Yeah, exactly. And, and that part, I don't know. I'm not a helicopter pilot. I don't know what the rules are there, but guys head over to, uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, head over to youtube.com slash flightcast audio, check that video out, flying the Murphy rebel and avoiding disaster. It's a good one. Um, and then also in the news is, uh, we changed our Instagram handle and you might be wondering, well, why would you do that? It was, fl- it was at flightcast. Uh, and, and I got Joe's input uh, Joe Riley's a Flightcast regular. We got his input on uh, from a marketing standpoint. And although Flightcast is a great handle, it wasn't consistent with uh, the website, Twitter, uh, Twitter especially, and Facebook and YouTube. And uh, yeah. so when my Instagram post went to Twitter, it didn't jive with the with the same handle. So um, we have changed it to Flightcast Audio. So if you're already following us, don't worry, you still are. And uh, for those who want to find us on Instagram, it's at Flightcast Audio, and you can find us there very easily. And, you know, I would also say that while they're on YouTube, and they after they subscribe to Flightcast Audio, they can go ahead and look up Infinite Flight. Yes, definitely. At YouTube.com slash Infinite Flight. And, and, you know, go ahead and uh, subscribe to our page as well. Yeah, to our channel definitely, and we might and as well on Instagram and we might as Facebook well give out a few Twitter. other shout outs while we're at it. Mark, we've we've uh, who have we promoted before? We've got uh, so you can look up Dan Torp Aviation. Some awesome yep, Dan um, That was interviews. a great great episode. Yeah, you can look these up on on our website as well. Um, look up Dan Flight Torp, Chops. Flight Chops. Uh, Steve Thorne. He's from here in Ontario, Canada, a uh, couple hours south of me. Um, really cool stuff. And someone I'd love to have on the podcast and I've been talking to is, uh, Steve-O Canivo. You can find him at Steve-O One Canivo <laughs> on YouTube. I love, and, I love it. Yeah. And those two guys, Flight Chops and, and, uh, Steve-O have teamed up on a really cool Coast Guard video series where yes. they, they're in the water with the Coast Guard, I think in Michigan. Yep. And uh, they've done some really, really cool stuff. So check those guys out for sure. And uh, yeah, all kinds of all kinds of great content that you guys can consume at your leisure. Yep, good stuff. All right, Mark, let's introduce today's guest. Yes, let's do that. Ryan Vince is a ramp service agent, ground security coordinator, and station trainer for Trago Dugan Aviation, serving primarily Frontier Airlines. If that doesn't keep him busy enough... He also works as a flight simulator technician at the University of Dayton in Ohio. Ryan has recently designed the 2016 FDS livery for the Boeing 787 Dreamliner and has consulted on various other liveries and textures for Flying Development Studio. Joining us today from Dayton, Ohio is Ryan Vince. Ryan, welcome to the podcast, man. Hello. How are you guys doing this evening? Good, good. Thanks for being here. Man, we're doing well. Welcome uh, welcome to the uh, 
to the flat cast, man. It's great to be here. I always watch your episodes, listen to your episodes, and it's great to finally get to be on here. Cool. Yeah, how is that when you watch the episode? I mean, do you <laughs> stay entertained as you watch it? <laughs> I just sit there watching the screen every second that goes by on the podcast. Yep. Very Just waiting for something to pop. You know what, Jason, we need to do? That reminds me. If people watched it on YouTube to listen to it, you know, like a couple minutes in, you just need to throw in like a zombie and a loud screen just to wake people up. That's a great idea. Except I know it is. people would start hitting the thumbs down button at that point, I would think. (laughs) (laughs) We'll, We'll table that idea for now. Uh, so Ryan, you're a busy dude and I don't really know where to start. So let's just go right back to the beginning. Um, why don't you give us a brief overview of what got you interested in aviation in the first place? And, uh, the, the same question I ask everybody, are you pilot? Okay. So if we start way back, I think aviation really, I flew on my first plane when I was, uh, about two weeks old going home for Christmas to visit my, uh, family. Okay. So too far back. Every, yeah. Be a long <laughs> yeah, too far back. But, yeah. <laughs> I've been around planes basically my entire life, so it was basically f- from just being a child, I was basically brainwashed to love planes. Okay. Um, I used to live in Chicago, so when I was really little, I, um, my dad would always tell me, tell us the story every time there's a family get-together, that I would sit in my high chair and look out the window. Um, when they were using – the planes were coming in from the west over the western suburbs, they would fly right over my old house into Chicago O'Hare. So nice. I had pretty much nonstop action of airplanes. I'd go run out in the yard and sit there and watch the planes and – Got into that, and then when my dad would go on business trips, every time he would come back, he would uh, bring me a little airplane model. So I basically got surrounded by him. Uh, <laughs> my dad my dad was a pilot for quite a while. He had his uh, private instrument and commercial, and I think he was looking at becoming a fl- um, flight instructor, but he didn't quite get that far. He was just looking – it was fun for him, and he had a flight simulator for FS-98 and – and I started playing that with him. I'd sit in his lap and we'd fly around. Very, very basic graphics back then. But I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And since then, every, every version of Flight Sim since I would had. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. More models and flying on airplanes was the favorite part of every trip I'd go on. So when I was like six or seven, my parents took me to Disney. Um, they asked me at the end of the trip what the, what the best part of the trip was. I said flying on the airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. Yep. So Very familiar. Over the summer, I was thinking of getting my pilot's license. However, work got in the way. Um, I really had no time at all. I, I took an intro introductory lesson um, end of last summer, but with school and then working as a ramp agent over the summer, there was absolutely no time to become a pilot, even though that's definitely something I'd like to do in the um, not too distant future. Okay. Cool. And so, well, I know some great tutorials that you could watch that would help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> would those happen to be your tutorials, Mark? <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> so, Ryan, you mentioned uh, the uh, uh, school. So, are you you attending the University of Dayton? Yes, I am. I am a student here at the University of Dayton. I'm a junior studying mechanical engineering with a concentration in aerospace engineering. Oh, wow! Nice. So, what's the what's the end game there? The end game is basically I'm I'm planning to get a just my degree in mechanical and then looking into going to graduate schools and getting a master in aerospace engineering. So basically I'm marketable on both sides. So I could either go into the mechanical field or the aerospace field. And they, they, the university told me that sometimes if you just get, let's say, an aerospace degree right out of, out of college, if, if you want to go into something in mechanical, you actually may be looked down upon because in aerospace, they may be expected to pay you more. And even though if you're a better candidate, they may not hire you just because of that. Okay. They said it leaves a bunch of doors open, which is what I would like to do, just get into the market and then kind of forget what I want to do there or maybe even be a pilot. So right. this is for your AMP as well? Um, this is just more on the um, engineering side. Oh, on the engineering side, okay. Yeah. So I'd be the one sitting there doing crazy experiments to figure out the – new engines, new wings, all that stuff. Nice. And would that be with, uh, like, engine manufacturers, do you think, or uh, 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 an airplane manufacturer? It, it, aerospace engineering is such a, such a wide market. I, that's what I've learned so far. I could be working with somebody like Boeing or Lockheed Martin or anybody like that, or I can be with an individual component company like uh, Spirit Aerospace that makes the 737 fuselages and stuff. There's, oh, okay. there's all these different companies that – 
And even if you think anything that in, involves kind of that aerodynamic shape, even like the auto industry, I can go into that because even though it's not flying, the same principles of aerodynamics and everything still apply. Oh yeah, but don't do you that. You know, you could, you could yeah. end up being the uh, the lab engineer. <laughs> oh no, no, no! I've had way too many bad experiences with those. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Well, we should hear about one of those. Uh, you also mentioned to me, Ryan, that you are uh, you have you work on the flight simulator at the university. Um, why don't you tell yes, us a little bit yep. about that? Okay, so basically we have a very unique flight simulator. We're the only university in the U.S. to have a uh, flight simulator like this. Normally when you think of a flight simulator, you think you just hop in a plane, you fly around, and that's it's kind of more of a fun thing or a training thing. However, um, the simulator that we use, it's, it's made by Merlin Flight Simulator, I believe, this Merlin group. Um, it's an engineering-based simulator. So we don't when we get the simulator, there's no planes or anything in it. But we have these editor things that we can go through all the parameters for the plane. And basically, we can calculate the parameters of, of a real plane, put them all in there, and it would simulate in real time what the plane would fly like. Or for like in higher level engineering classes, we could from scratch research and come up with the values and put it in the sim and actually see how it would fly, oh, which wow. is really cool because um, I recently just put a Boeing 757 into the sim and found out that one of my math calculations was uh, just a little bit off and there was an extra zero on the engine thrust. <laughs> you know, the 757 is already powerful to begin with. Uh, I did a max takeoff and was climbing out at about 17,000 feet a minute and gaining speed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I think something is not quite right here. Just just a little bit off. Mark wasn't in the so airplane that's all, then. That, yeah, I, yeah, it wasn't way down with me in it. So, <laughs> so that's what Laura needs to do is just add a zero to the, to the end of the code on the 757 so we can get a little bit more power on that thing. I think she has done oh, that yeah. with some of the flight models just so she can – cross the Atlantic a little more quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to see the training server if we put an extra zero in the uh, 757 thrust and just see people just blast off. You know, I, my takeoff roll was like 250 feet from the stop. <laughs> <laughs> just wait for someone to find out what it what's going on. That'd be great. Yep. That's what I love about the 787 that we have, man, because – uh, and, and a lot of people have seen it and, and Jay, you've flown with me enough. You've seen it a bunch of times that as soon as I'm clear for takeoff, a lot of times I will, I'll, I'll send a message to the controller on Slack and request a, uh, uh, unrestricted climb mm -hmm. and <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll take off basically as soon as the main gear comes off the ground, I raise them and then I level off and fly to the end of the runway. And then I just pitch up <laughs> and I'm climbing at 15, 16 thousand feet a minute and and almost you know gaining speed but i sustained the speed for quite a while yeah it's a beast so oh i love it yep uh, so ryan tell us a little bit more about what your job with um as being a ramp service agent with uh trego dugan so what, what is that what does your job entail basically i handle everything that's below wing which is out on the ramp and and no day is the same. Some days I might just be loading and unloading the bags. Some and days I at, may not even get to. Th sorry, this is at, at Dayton Port International. Uh, this is at Port Columbus, and oh, it's John Glenn Columbus International oh, okay, Airport okay. now. But Port Columbus, I, it's always going to be Port Columbus to me. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, basically, I work all all it's all different things we do. Some days I may not even see the planes. I'll be in the bag room, uh, just sorting the bags out on the right carts to go out to the plane and. It sounds like it can be easy, except for sometimes you would sit in there for like 40 minutes, like, where are all the bags? And then it's just, it's just like you hit a slot machine in Vegas, and bags mm -hmm. start coming down left and right, and you and got three different flights all at once, and you're the only one there running around like an idiot as 50 bags are going around the belt, just trying to sort them and keep them so, they don't, so you can get enough bags in the cart. Right. Then you got then TSA all, back in the bag rooms who were sitting there going through them as well, slowing you up. Um, in Port Columbus, we actually we actually have it's a separate TSA screening thing. So everything goes all the way through on a, like one belt, and then uh, one of the, it's good and bad. It goes on, goes all through on one belt, and then it splits it out to us and oh, goes down okay. to our belts. Um, the funny thing is though, if the bag tag reader for whatever reason goes crazy, it sends them all to the default belt, which we've had happen, where it sends all of the American Airlines bags. Um, I believe 
United and our bags all on one, just one little belt that dumps them out on the floor if you don't catch them quick enough. <laughs> so nice. it, it was the morning rush, and one day it, it, it stopped reading all of the tags. So like 10 American flights, our, our flight, and then some United flights. They were like, where are all the bags? Let me just go over there. The American's like, you might want to come over here and help. And there was like 100 bags just all over the ground, and it, 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 that was not fun there. <laughs> And so uh, you you're sometimes back in the uh, where the bags are being sorted, and then sometimes you're out on the ramp uh, at doing what what kind of stuff? Basically, I would handle loading and unloading the bags. Um, have the wonderful joy of dumping the lavatories, filling the water, and that that's really the big <laughs> stuff. Any anything that you see us out on uh, in somebody out on the ramp doing with the plane, I've probably done it at one point or another. Also, like pushing back the plane, bringing it in, marshaling it in, is fun at first it was terrifying like i have to tell them where to stop on this little line but it gets pretty easy after you four or five times right the okay. marshalling and the pushback was always my favorite i love pushing back that's a lot of fun mark are the marshals the guys that are walking with the little wand thingies out on the out on the end of the wings uh no those are wing walkers oh they always the look marshalling. they always look bored to tears <laughs> they are they are and half the time they don't even look they're not even paying attention so the 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 lead marshaler has got to be very aware of everything that's going on uh now it back in the day i used to love and and i doubt that you've done this ryan but we would we would do power backs out of the gate and love doing power backs you got to wear your goggles or you're going to get sand blown in your eyes but i love doing power backs as well yeah we have we haven't done any of those since all of our um, aircrafts have the wing mounted engines so you're going to suck everything in but uh once or twice we saw um, the american a few gates over would do that if their pushback was having an issue and if you weren't expecting that those md80s are so loud and, Very. and awesome it just blows dust everywhere and so the md80 awesome. or the um or the crjs or whatever any rear mounted engine aircraft just what turn turn on their reversers and go backwards yep well, uh, more yeah the crjs don't do them as often uh but they they can do them the the md80s um what and and what you have to do just to kind of give you an idea after a plane's been sitting there for a while they're going to get what's called a flat spot on the tire so as okay. soon as you look at your wing walkers and they're clear uh which you've got to look anyway um you've got to actually bring the plane forward a little bit to get it off of that flat spot okay. because if they can't go straight into reversers from that, uh, from a park position. So you bring them forward to get them off the flat spot. And with the MD eighties, as soon as you start to give them the, uh, the power back signal, uh, the shields, like you see on the seven seventeen after you land the shields, uh, deploy, and then you have all that thrust from the engines hitting those shields, and that thrust, of course, comes forward, which pushes the plane back. And that thrust is coming all at you. And it's just crazy, but I love it. <laughs> Why would they do that when they have a push tug? <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of outstations don't have uh, push tractors, or they have lazy mechanics who don't want to fix the push tugs or the push tractors, <laughs> and so you're having yep. a power back. An American used to do... Nothing but power backs and outstations. Huh. Wow. Interesting. This is stuff I had no idea was going on. Very cool. Uh, okay. So, uh, Ryan, any before we get off of this topic of of uh, working on the ramp, any any other stories or anything you want to tell us? I, I got I got a good one. As I mentioned, the wonderful joy of servicing the labs. Uh, I got it. This wasn't directly servicing the labs, but this was a wonderful experience with the lab cart itself, which did everybody at, at um, CMH knows definitely about this incident. Um, one morning, I I had I finally got a few days off, which was kind of rare. But I was when I, when the time I was like, oh man, I finally got two days off. I was happy, but. I, wish I could have worked every day because I have so much fun over the summer. But I came back after a few days off. It was early in the morning, and um, I was like the first or second one there. And one, and somebody left a note saying the lav cart was messed up. And I'm like, okay. And so they said there was an issue with the gauge. And I'm like, oh, I know what's wrong with that. You just got to go hit the gauge really hard, and it'll pop, and it'll, it'll start working again. So I do that, and the gauge is still acting kind of funny. And then – so I'm like, okay, I turn it off, turn it on, and I noticed a very small leak from the gauge. I'm like, 
okay, maybe, maybe there's a bigger issue, but worst case, um, we'll, we have a flight that's going to land here in about 25 minutes, so I'll call maintenance after that and have it uh, have them look at it. Uh, at that point, the, the lap cart makes an extremely loud boom, and the hose for the blue juice comes flying off the gauge and is just spraying blue no. juice everywhere. I guess like <laughs> five or ten feet up in the air, just spraying <laughs> And everyone run, runs away from it. So we're like, now what do we do? Because it's just – and we just filled the thing with blue juice. So it's, it dumped basically the entire thing of blue juice all over the ramp. And that does Thankfully, not come out easily. Oh, no. And you can see – that happened back in August. You can still see the stain on the ramp <laughs> where that is now. That's awesome. And that's your stain. You, you, <laughs> yep. And, and you, you, you see our um, customer service agents in the window just look, this terrified look of their heads, faces right up against the glass as we're running away. Well, as long, but at least it was, at least it was the blue water that you were actually adding into the plane and not the green water oh, yeah, that you were dumping yeah. out of the plane. Cause we all know that yellow and blue make green. Yep. So it's a good thing. It wasn't the green water that you were dumping. Oh yeah, that that would have been bad. Yeah, and you always want to make sure that donut is sealed tight. Oh yeah, before yep. you open the valve, because if not, if you're in a rush and you spin that donut, just thinking you've locked it, and all of a sudden, as soon as you pull that dump valve, and then that little donut starts to shake, and you can't get to it fast enough. <laughs> huh. Oh yeah, nice. I saw that. I was I was traveling. I was in a, a Dallas Fort Worth, and uh, American did that. That dumped the seven sixty seven worth of lav stuff on the ramp. <sighs> that that was not a pretty sight. Our flight got delayed like an hour and a half while they cleaned it up. Gross. Yeah, that'll make yeah. for a crappy day right there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I did something similar, but not not as gross. Um, when I was a teenager, I I worked at a. a Ford dealership and so I got to go in after hours and change my oil in my car so I put it up on the hoist and drained the oil put the took the oil filter off put the new one on put the oil in the car and I I drove when I was done I drove up the street and by the time I got about a block away my oil light went on and I was in a rush when I had done it and when I took the oil filter off I didn't get the rubber gasket off the engine from the old oil filter. So now there's two gaskets mm-hmm. on the yep. <laughs> between the filter and the engine. And uh so it just leaked oil out all the way up the street. <laughs> <laughs> so not as gross, but potentially uh very bad. And luckily it was up a hill so I could just coast back down, turn around, coast back down the hill with my engine off <laughs> and back to the <laughs> garage. Uh but no, not not very good. Mark, have you heard of Live Flight for Infinite Flight? Yeah, man. I've used it to track flights and to see which regions and airports are busy before, you know, planning my flight. Right. Well, as you probably know, a new version of Live Flight is now available at liveflightapp.com. This new version is better than ever and has been rebuilt from the ground up. With a new design, more flight stats, a search feature, and airport information, tracking and planning your flight is easier than ever. Oh, man, I know. And now with the new downloadable KML files, You can download your flight data to any Earth browser, such as Google Earth. It's so cool. Absolutely. And if that wasn't enough, you can now subscribe to Live Flight Horizon, a new service for only $1.99 a month that provides real-time, worldwide airport information such as weather, runway data, and charts. It also allows you to search for flights, active ATC frequencies, and airports. And as a Live Flight Horizon subscriber, you'll also get much longer online sessions, and you'll be helping Cam to keep developing and improving this great app. So guys, make sure you head over to liveflightapp.com to give it a try, and also subscribe to Live Flight Horizon. It will make your infinite flight experience so much better. And now back to the podcast. So Ryan... Why don't we get to some of your work with Infinite Flight? Um, how did you get connected with FDS in the first place? It was way back before the first iOS release. Um, I saw that they had uh, the Windows Phone at the time, and I had an uh, well, I think it was an iPod Touch back then. And I was like, man, that would be really cool if they come to iOS. Come to iOS. So at the time, I sent, sent Matt at the time an email and just asked, is, is there any is there any plans that um to come into iOS and said so the simulator looks really cool and love to see it in iOS. It looks far better than anything we have for iOS. And he, um, he replied and basically said that 
if we're, yeah, we're working on it. If uh, Maybe I can shoot you an email when we get close to the testing time if you want to help out. And I said, sure, I'd love that. And then got on board from there and kind of stuck around. I did testing for a while. And when the E340 came out, uh, I was I just begged and begged and begged because I tried making a livery for it. And I did the uh, Airbus house colors livery for it. it it's, it's pretty bad by today's standards, but that was, that was my first – uh, livery I actually did for um, Infinite Flight, which and then kind of from there, um, off and on, talked about some livery stuff, and then we came to the point where uh, I think it was the 737 when it was redone with Autoland. Um, they wanted a new um, house colors, and I said I'd, I'd be up for the challenge on that. And basically, I said I, from there I kind of did some more, and then. Each new plane that came out, I've done the house colors on that, and I also did a few of the uh, triple seven. So it kind of just grew over time from this an initial email. Okay, and then you, uh, you're, I'm assuming your inspiration behind the new FDS uh, library must have been from the new logo. Uh, so what if that? And correct me if I'm wrong, but what? And then what goes into creating a library like that? What was your? So was the logo your inspiration, and and what was your thought process there? So basically, when I make a, um, any sort of paint scheme of like my own, I kind of when I start, I have an image, kind of an abstract of something that is supposed to um, represent. And if you look at the older um, house livery that you had the um, the old logo with the plane kind of flying between the clouds and the sun, and the uh, rays of the sun. Yeah. That that in that livery, the um, the curve on the fuselage was meant to represent the bottom of the cloud, and the blue on the bottom was the sky below it, and the orange kind of the um, sunset outline of that. Did you do that one so too? I actually, yeah. Oh, okay, nice. All all of those were done by okay. me as well. Yeah. Um, so so it, I it kind of it starts with kind of an abstract idea like that might look kind of cool, and I normally sketch them out on paper. There's a whole bunch of different revisions, and then. Um, you kind of go from there, and like oh, that kind of looks cool. And then you have to also you have to think about the constraints of how it's going to fit on the plane. Like I can't add an elaborate design at the top or the bottom of the fuselage most of the time because that gets uh, stretched as just the way it's unfolded the plane to put the texture on it. Okay. So you basically yeah, it kind of starts with an abstract idea. For the for the new, new one, I was kind of thinking since you have an airplane as um, directly part of the logo. What would happen if you made it kind of look like it was flying? So I took that the, the airplane with the streak that comes off the uh, tail that goes all the way down the length of the fuselage to the front. That's basically kind of like the kind of jet stream or the um, whatever you want to call it that comes off the back of that plane. So you have kind of the, the sky below, and then I just like the other one, I kind of kept the initial inspiration of the white or the grayish silver part on the 787 was the clouds. So and then. I match that up with the some of the flying development studios colors. If, if you look really close, those are the colors in the forum. I may or may not have just taken those from the forum. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, just be like, ooh, that looks like a nice blue. Click. <laughs> yeah. Screenshot that, put it in Photoshop, pull the color off of it, and go from there. Very cool. It's a. It, and what uh, you said. Oh, I'm sorry, no, Jason. No, go ahead, bud. Well, what I was going to say is, uh, you said that you sketch them out. Uh, first, you know, you do a few drafts. Now, I, you know, you, you've shared with me some of your work that you draw out, and dude, you are so talented just on freehand drawing an aircraft. It is unreal. I mean, how long have you been drawing? The drawings that you've seen recently, um, I started that about just really getting into it. It was about a year. ago. A year ago, um, I got an iPad Pro for Christmas with an Apple Pencil, and I'm like, got Adobe Sketch was a free app, so I started playing around with that, and the first few were not very good, and I'm like, trying to get used to drawing on a screen versus on a piece of paper, but then I thought, oh, man, this, you can do a lot here, because like I can look at a set of picture of the real plane next to it, and I can fool the actual colors right from that, which is something I definitely can't do on a piece of paper. Kind of like if I did, I did an elaborate livery, uh, like uh, Southwest Illinois 1. Um, I was able to pull all the colors off a real picture to match. So, and I went with that, and then each one gets better and better. I look at real airplanes. 
I think working on the ramp helped me a lot because I kind of got to see a lot of the details and stuff that, you know, like you look at a picture on the internet, there's not quite enough detail to look at like the individual panel lines and this and that, but being out on the planet, like I can, I, and all that stuff. Yeah. And like, I can just go up and touch the, you know, about say three twenty one in front of me and I can draw that. So that's what that little, um, warning label says or this and that. So yeah, I kind of started that about a year ago and then I just got better and better. And then I, at first, they, they were originally just kind of meant to be sketches, but then I kind of transitioned over from it just being a sketch to it being more of a vibrant, colored, like fully filled-in color thing. It's almost hard to tell that everything was done in my drawings actually by the pencil tools, what they call it. It looks more of almost like a computer-rendered thing, but with drawing aspect. Well, I have to say, man, the the uh, new FDS library on the 787 is my favorite right now and uh i've i've got basically uh the the air france 787 has my call sign on it and i still prefer to fly the <laughs> i still prefer to fly the the one that you did it's beautiful i love it i, just I was shot it. down on having a northwest bowling shoe 787 well that <clears> would just be silly mark finished typing <laughs> well, you know, I, I've seen renditions of it, and you know, I didn't even get finished typing the request um, <laughs> with everybody, and and it's no, like Mark. they knew what was coming, and they just shot it down. Don't even ask, Mark. <laughs> Don't even no ask. More bowling shoes. <laughs> but we somehow got Delta. Oh yeah, of course we're going to get Delta. <laughs> just don't do another United. That's got to be the b- most boring paint scheme. And United's rolling out these new seven, triple uh, seven, whatever it is, three hundred ERs. Yep. And it's such yeah. a pretty airplane. And then they throw that livery on it. It's like, ugh, it's so corporate. Yeah, looking. yeah, my friend was just yeah, my friend was just yesterday saying like that that plane already looks old with that paint scheme. Exactly, on it. Like, exactly. It looks old and dated. Yeah, a buddy um, of mine loads up over in Denver area, and <clears throat> he works in Denver for Untied. I mean United. And he he's always posting pictures on how much he loves it, and I'm just like, it looks yeah, like everything else for the past X amount of years. You know, shout out to uh, our friends at United, but um, sorry, you need to come up with a f- more uh, paint scheme that's a little more fun. You're... Yeah, I like it. I, they just took Continental, and it lo- literally looks like they opened it in paint and took the default, and what is it? Helvetica bold font and put United on it and called <laughs> exactly. it good. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly what they did. They took yeah. the Continental Livery and put it on there. And I'm like, come on, guys, you know, if do you something look really, if, if you look really close on some of the ex-Continental planes, you can see they just literally patched over Continental and put the United part on it. Even today, you can see there's still a few hanging around. that You can still <laughs> see the white box that says Continental, and then they just painted United over it. That's what I do with the Airbuses that have Delta on the side. I just look at the tail number, and it's an old Northwest tail number, and I'm just like, yeah, it's a Northwest. Well, all the, all the Airbus 320 series that Delta has, I believe, are all nor- former Northwest birds. And, Mark, so, you and I got a picture with a pretty iconic former Northwest bird uh, back in September. Yes. Yes, we did. That was my baby, the uh, the 747 in Atlanta. Yep. We'll have to go back there, and uh, it's being turned into. It's parked at the uh, just uh, adjacent to the uh, flight museum, right? Uh, the yes. Delta Flight Museum uh, on the other side of the parking lot, and they're turning it into. It's got the obviously the Delta paint scheme on it still, but uh, they're turning it into a museum. So they we'll actually be able to go into that. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but we digress. So uh, you know, Infinite Flight and Flightcast fans who love United, no offense. But you need new paint. Anyway, yeah. Um, go, go back to go back to the old tulip. There you go. It's my show. <laughs> I can say what I want. Uh, now you work for a company that has very cool paint jobs. Uh, Frontiers uh, Airbuses, baby buses, <laughs> have uh, some really cool liveries. Well, I guess you don't work directly for them, but they consider me part of their family. There so you go. I, I, we can call it that. There you go. Since since uh, somebody at Frontier found one of my drawings and it was just up on the employee homepage a few weeks ago, so oh really? Yes, nice. I'm part of the family. Yeah. Okay. So Ryan, you mentioned uh, other textures to me while we were planning for this chat. So without giving away any company secrets or anything that you're not supposed to say, what does other textures mean if you're not talking so, about airplane uh, paint? The other textures, um, the ones that I worked on, basically, if you were 
it's, it's been a little while now, but if you remember the update where we had all the new airport lines and stuff, the textures that it, the lines that it draws from to put on the textures, those were all done by me. I just basically okay. went through, I went through uh, way too long sitting looking at FAA books to figure out the spacing for everything, and then oh, wow. going back and forth with, oh, that doesn't look right in the game, or it's stretched out and it looks crazy and back and forth and we finally kind of narrowed it down to what, what we had now was that the was, update where they added the 319 the 3 a320 family and they updated all the paint uh on I'm, the ground yeah i believe that that was yeah okay which and like and i thought it was going to be an easy like 20 minute texture at first but that took like two weeks to narrow it down to actually have it do what it was supposed to and oh, the first great. i yeah, at first we put them that we put them there, and then there was random bleed over from the other textures. Like if you look further away, like you know, if you look further down, like if you're low to the ground, you look at like a far off taxiway, and how it gets slightly blurry yeah. as it goes out in the distance. Yeah. That's just how a computer renders it. At first, those were overlapping, so suddenly you see like blobs on like the white lines. You see blobs of yellow randomly appearing in there. So it was ah. it was a mess for a while, and lots of trial and error. I'm like, it looks fine on my end, and then. Somebody else is like, no, no, it looks horrible. And But in the end, it turned out pretty good. Yeah, Texture work is a lot of guess and try and, and go back and adjust and try again and adjust again and get angry at it, want to throw the computer out the window, and then it finally turns out okay in the end. Cool. You yeah, know, Ryan, In the grown-up world, that's process of elimination. <laughs> in Ryan's world, it's uh, throw things at the wall. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Throw the iPad at the wall. Ryan, I'd love to, if if uh, it's allowed, I'd love to take one of your, or or even do a series uh, leading up to this episode release uh, of some of your work in progress stuff, if that would be okay, maybe on Instagram. Yeah, you can, I, I can definitely pull up some, not, not so much textures for directly from Infinite Flight, but I can pull up some of my personal projects. Make note, this is not for Infinite Flight. I've worked on some airplanes like a um, 737 Classic and an MD-80 I just just to play around to learn the 3D modeling programs. And I can definitely show off those textures like, like oh, from yeah, cool. the base up, how I started off. It's basically a white blob that looks nothing like an airplane. Ooh, I love that idea, yeah. Mark. We'll really confuse people by putting the MD-80 up there. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and put a block on my inbox on the forum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and what's, what's even better is that the MD-80 uses the same textures that the polished American 777 uses in Infinite Flight. Because I made those textures, so I just took them and put them on there. So if you look at the stripes and everything else, it looks identical. So you'd really create some uh, chaos with that one. That's like the silver one? Is that what you mean by polished? Yes. Okay, yep. got it. Yep. Cool. Which is my favorite American library. Oh, yeah. It looks, I love, it looks I love awesome. that. No, I'd really, I'd really like to see a 737-800 Infinite Flight with the polished. Have haven't quite uh, gotten the approval to do that one, but I'd love to see that one. I'm assuming yes. that exists in real life. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's a whole. There's, that's pretty much all that's still left in the polished besides the MD-80s. Oh, okay. And well, some of the 767s now, right now here in Mobile, at downtown Mobile Airport, um, at Brooklyn Field, they've got two 767s right now that are still in the old library. Uh, but they're all covered up. They've been sent down here to get the new paint. Um, so those are still sitting up there. All right, guys. Well, let's uh, transition now into some forum and Instagram questions. In fact, I think this time we only have forum questions. So, uh, yeah, and guys, if I uh, – listeners, if I didn't uh, – if I don't mention your name and you ask the question, um, the same question that I'm I'm – we're answering then uh, i apologize there were a lot of duplicates this time on the forum so um just imagine me asking from you so kieran is asking uh ryan how long does it take on average to complete one library on the 787 and before you answer uh, people keep mentioning 4k textures uh throughout these questions so maybe in your answer can you explain what that means so uh how long for for a 787 library or yeah, you mention any airplane you want, but you did mention talking about the eight, uh, the seven eight seven. Okay, so I think the first place to start would be the four K textures. That basically, that's how many we basically each texture we start out with is going to be in a square block that the game reads. Basically, kind of think of it like unfolding a cereal box. And once it's un, all unfolded, you have all the different parts for the airplane are basically pieced out on on a flat piece. And four K basically is 
is how many pixels across and up and down that uh, block is. For a long time, video games were 1,024 by 1,024 pixels, which I think that's what some of the very old planes in Infinite Flight are. And then as graphics became better, they, they, came, they doubled it to 2048 by 2048, which for smaller airplanes or small, um, like let's say a Cessna 172, that might very well look just like a 4K because it's a smaller plane. So right. the 4K textures are 4096 by 4096 pixels. So basically it allows more pixels to be stretched out across a bigger plane so that you get more detail in the texture itself. Okay, and on a on a computer screen or a TV, that that's translated by uh, more pixels in the same amount of space, correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Like we like we can just save a texture as different sizes, and you would just notice like the window lines wouldn't be as clear, and like the small text like on the seven eighty seven, the fleet number eight er would be blurry, and it and and kind of some of the little logos by the door, like the flight cast logo and the. Uh, some of the other little things like the Wi-Fi that you wouldn't be able to see that, but it basically it just allows you to put the little details in there and make things look more crisp, like the line between on the plane, the blue to the orange to the uh, Got gray. It. Got it. By the way, speaking of the Flightcast logo beside the door, I didn't even know that was there until Joe told me. <laughs> And he's like, "Oh, so now you got your you got your call sign on one and your logo on the other one." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He's like. <laughs> Your logo is on, on the FDS version of the 787. I'm like, oh. And that's followed that's nice. with, thanks for the invite. Yeah. So the funny part of that story, though, is that I then immediately go on Slack and I thank Laura for putting my logo on the airplane. She goes, what are you talking about? <laughs> she didn't even know. <laughs> so I told good. her. Yeah, well, she has to keep track of a lot of stuff. So uh, it was great. But uh, so, yeah, thanks. Thanks. That's before we even were chatting. Just added that in there. I'm like, what? How many logos did I stick on the side of the door? I'm like, this is a high-res texture. Let's just start putting logos on the flight cast, and then um, and we, had, uh, Joe's, we should say Joe Suter on there as well. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I should say yeah, too I did a little that logo for him right above yours on there by the door. Yeah, very cool. <laughs> I should also add that uh, I asked you about uh, doing a podcast podcast episode. Uh, before the, I found out that the logo was on there too. So uh, it's all just coming full circle. <laughs> now what we need to do is go ahead. Uh, Ryan, I'll go ahead and send you the Skyhawk Heavy logo in PNG and uh, get you to implement that <laughs> on something. Maybe You'd on one like of the it. Northwest birds. That would be great. You'd like it on every plane from this from this point out. Just somewhere on the plane, hide it. Yep. Uh, on any plane, as long as it's a Boeing or a C-130 or a 172. That actually would be kind of fun. Find some, find a little logo or something and hide a little it Easter egg. on the, on yeah, the plane. Yeah, a little Easter yeah. egg. There you go. See, yeah, see who, can, see who could find it. Kind of like some of the um, airplanes in Flight Sim. Uh, PMDG is one of the premier development add-on development groups over there. Somewhere on every payroll plane they've released is a pogo stick model hidden somewhere in the plane, and you have to find it. Ah, nice. <laughs> like it's sometimes in the cargo bin. And uh, sometimes in the cockpit, so it's just kind of it's kind of just a little Easter egg. It's, it's always fun looking for it as soon as you get the plane. Nice, yeah, Mark. That would actually be pretty sweet if uh, the Skyhawk Heavy logo was on the C one thirty. Yes, I agree. <laughs> I that agree. would be awesome. Uh, all right, so Adam is asking: Have there been any libraries that you would like to see in Infinite Flight, but for some reason uh, you haven't been able to uh, get them in there? Uh, the funny this is this this is going to be a, this is a good one. I wanted on the initial release of the A319. I wanted the Northwest Bowling Shoe, and that got shot down. Really? Yeah, I'm like, I want to make it. And <laughs> that got shot down. I'm like, no. I love, I love Bowling Shoe liver. I got a Bowling Shoe MD80 sitting right next to me on the desk, my desk right now, and I love those classic liveries. And <laughs> normally, yeah, it's basically. It is pretty bad. So I will say that yeah. it is the best livery around. Wow. I, I really like, yeah. Well, I think American still wins for me the polish, but that's right behind it. Well, they, that's polished. That's well, polished. and they're, but they're, the American's tail, though, and, and, you know, I'm no American, but that tail on that airplane looks incredible. The new one or the old one? The new one. Yeah, the on that 787, yes. because that, those, that, those look really good that tail numbers. number really enhances that tail. 
Yeah, it's it's so, amazing. Yeah, the registration on the set on the American seven eighty seven that tail number really boost the seven eighty seven dash nine the American Airlines. I mean, come on. But just the the paint job too. I'm not talking about your call sign mark. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch on to that like, one nearly fast enough. Yeah, that that, <clears throat> that kind of went over my head. I'm like, oh, wait a minute, wait yeah. a minute. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I was starting to get a little concerned. I mean, <laughs> really? Just Mark's just so disappointed in me right now. We'll talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Infinite Dot Flight is uh, from the forum is asking uh, Ryan, what got you interested in becoming a ramp agent in the first place? Well, um, it was kind of actually an impulse decision. I was uh, actually going through Instagram one day, and I saw that um, Port Columbus posted, like, hey, Frontier's coming to Columbus, and they're looking for ramp agents, and I click here if you want to apply. And I'm like, oh, it's 10 minutes before dinner. I just sent my resume, I just sent a quick email, <laughs> and uh, five minutes later, I get an email back, uh, when do you want to have an interview? And I'm like, oh, okay, this just sounds like fun, so... And like oh, it'll be part time. I'll just work a few hours, a few days a week over the summer, kind of enjoy it. But that turned into working morning, noon, and night every day. But I <laughs> still enjoyed it every moment of it. Because airplanes, right? Yeah, because airplanes and yeah. the people I worked with. I mean, it's, it's met so many good friends just just working there. Like um, Chris, one of the people I worked with. He, I mean, we text each other every time air, air, any airplane story or anything. We're sending pictures of airplanes to each other. Um, Secretly planning to buy an airplane, which is never going to happen. We're like, look, there's a U-727 for $900,000. We should buy that. <laughs> never going to happen. But Joe just sent us something on Slack uh, yesterday, actually, saying, hey, uh, here's a UC-130. Only, what was yeah. it, $900,000 $900, a $900,000 piece. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That would be a ton of fun. But uh, I am lacking pilot's but- license at this point. Well, and I'm only a single engine pilot, so I can only fly with one engine. Let alone now, four of them. <laughs> if if Tyler will figure out what the <laughs> fog is and he can get his pilot's license, then we got two engines. We can at least get off the ground. Yeah, yeah. You, you, you got <laughs> so, one of them. Uh, yeah. So, what, what would an episode uh, be without Tyler? We'll we'll just fly with the inboards and the outboards. That'll just save us on fuel. There you go. I like so, where your head's at. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and and Ryan. Has it really gotten uh, really cold up there, uh, up in Dayton yet? Uh, not yet. For Surprisingly, it was 80 degrees here yesterday for mm. whatever strange reason. Fall really never didn't hit. There were a few cold days, but it, it's been staying ridiculously warm. I feel like I'm going to pay for that in a, in a month or so when it's snowing and yeah, definitely. Well, a disaster. But let, let me tell you this. Well, first of all, you know when you go out on the ramp – for kickoffs first thing in the morning you're out there i was out there at four o'clock in the morning i mean that, that was like the only job i was ever on time for if not early because i wanted to get out there yep. and you have that that smell of that jet fuel and oh, i know yes. that's saying i love the smell of jet fuel in the morning but let me tell you when winter hits that smell is amplified you think oh, you love it now wait for the winter and then when they put you in the cherry picker for de icing, oh my gosh, that glycol tastes so sweet. So when you're spraying a uh, when you're spraying the tail section and all that, make sure that you get in the way of the blowback. <laughs> so that way weird. your face will never freeze up, and that glycol <laughs> gets all. Well, you know, it got all put all up in my whiskers and my beard, and my mustache and everything else. And so I'm sitting there and got glycol all up in there. And I never, my face never froze out there looking like Winnie the Pooh in my red freaking coveralls. <laughs> Ryan, if you could just go ahead and paint us a picture of that, that'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, Ryan, anything else that you you want to add before we go today? Um, I think we covered just got you found out a lot about me. We covered all the artwork, all the work I've done with Flying Development Studios and yeah, very model cool. airplanes, and just I think we got just about everything there. I'd, I'd like to thank you for having me on the show. It's been a lot of fun. Maybe we can come back and do it again. And if you don't, if you can't find anybody else, I'm, all, I'm always here. <laughs> <laughs> sounds sounds like Joe. <laughs> I don't say you're always here because this has been a very difficult episode to nail down the time. Okay, well, see, you know what. 
here's what happens. The, the college happens. We have people and we're like, oh, the flight sim's open. I got time. And then 12 hours before I see, I, get, I have 28 emails in my inbox from people like, hey, I need to do my homework that's due tomorrow. I'm like, oh, I, I can't get you all in in no time and when, when you wait to the last, last second and now fighting over the slot. <laughs> Because I've got like 39 calendar invites from Jason in my inbox right now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know that calendar invite? Disregard. Here's a new one. Yeah. Uh, you know, all good, man. I appreciate you taking time for us. And uh, thanks for being on the show and chatting with us today. Yep. It's nice talking to you guys. Yeah, man. Thanks for being here. That was real world ramp service agent and infinite flight design consultant, Ryan Vince. And he has joined us today on Skype from Dayton, Ohio. Guys, thanks as always for listening, and if you haven't already, head over to the App Store or Google Play and download Infinite Flight. For more of the podcast, please visit our website and be sure to subscribe on iTunes or YouTube. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash flightcastaudio, on Twitter at flightcastaudio, and now on Instagram at flightcastaudio. Flightcast is brought to you by Linkhouse Media on the web at linkhousemedia.com. We can always use your help to keep the podcast rolling, and a few ways to do that are by clicking the donate button at the bottom of our website or by heading to flightcast.com audio slash shop to buy your very own Flightcast gear. And just in time for the holidays, grab your new Flightcast hoodie. To cover the fine print, Flightcast is not affiliated with Infinite Flight or Flying Development Studio. I'm Jason Rosewell. Thanks again for listening and happy landings. Hey, I'm going to go off the top for just a second. Speaking of avid model collectors... I have a model airplane addiction. I'm going to admit it <laughs> that I have like over 300 models sitting around the house. At this Holy point. crap. That blows yep. Steven's it's collection a, out of the water. It, it, it's, 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 hard, it's hard to say no when you get them at wholesale price. You're like, oh, that, that's cheap. Let's, we'll get that. And, oh, look, there's a Frontier model coming out. Got to get that one. Uh, anything American. I... Man, you're like, the, <laughs> you're like the crazy cat lady of airplane models. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I know that there's like eight or nine more of them waiting for me when I go home. Do you so. tuck them all in at night? Yeah. Pet yeah. them a little bit? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I, have, I have like eight Frontier models sitting on my desk right now, too. So the, <laughs> People are going to be listening to this yeah, going, what is happening? Go ahead and get you a spray bottle, fill it with a little water, put it on mist. And go ahead and start misting the plane so you can start practicing for de-icing during the winter season. <laughs> okay. I think it's time to wrap this up. <laughs> what has happened to this episode? Um, all right. Well, he started when he was two weeks old. Come on. That's true. That's true. <laughs> now, Hello. that's what I call teamwork. Booyah. I made it through the intro without missing a beat messing up you made it through the outro without messing up that's teamwork right there and Boom. and just i want to say thank you for typing that slow so i could read it oh you're welcome that's i typed what, it as slow as i could yeah i know and it probably drove you nuts but at least i was able to read it that way <laughs>